Today we're joined by violinist Sarah Darling to talk about the evolution of the violin bow. Sure thing. So can you tell me a little bit about the difference between the Baroque bow and the modern bow? What makes these two, these two bows different? Yeah. Um, the Baroque bow is a lovely little rhetorical device. So when we talk about rhetoric, we're talking about using, you know, using our words and using our constructions to convince somebody of something, to uh, make them to make them sort of exquisitely aware of the power of your use of words. So uh, here's here are a few musical words. What I absolutely love about the Baroque bow is that it is an engine which is finely, finely, finely designed to speak. Let's take a look at the modern bow. Here's our friend the modern bow. Without thinking too much about it, I'm going to play that very first thing that I just played. That as even as I play this piece of Baroque music on the, the modern bow, the bow is sort of smoothing it out. It's pulling longer lines out of it. It's making it louder as well. Um, it's saying, you know, wouldn't you like to be driving, you know, this nice powerful Hummer instead of that annoying little sports car? <laughs> <laughs> so the modern bow is an incredible tool, and what this tool is designed to do is to create power and to sustain and to be kind of beautifully balanced so that you can just do anything you want on this powerful, powerful institute and instrument. There's a kind of a bass line for the, for the modern bow. I'm going to pick up a Baroque bow and just demonstrate the same thing without changing anything. Back to the modern bow. Let's start playing some of those words I was playing before. playing a bow because as you do it basically starts telling you what it wants and this bow is saying to me like hey Sarah don't you want to play a little louder don't you want to play a longer line and I'm saying well, yeah maybe I do <laughs> Meanwhile, the Baroque bow is over there saying, what are you doing? You know, whatever happened to like grace and tact? So, not only are they designed to express 
things that are perhaps fundamentally the same using extremely different um, materials to do so. Um, they're also designed to fill different spaces. This bow is, I think, designed to be a bow that I can use to talk to you with. But I'm not really sure I would want to talk to you at such close range with a modern bow. I think if I wanted to talk to you with a modern bow, I'd want you to be about 20 feet back. <laughs> yeah. So just super interesting. You know, I mean, in the one case, I'm playing for I'm playing for people at court. Maybe they're drinking champagne and maybe they're five feet away from me. Um, you know, with a modern bow, I might be playing a piece by Prokofiev in a 2,000 seat hall and wanting to make sure that each one of these people hears every little precise motion that I'm playing on my powerful steel strings that I do not have with me today. <laughs> so you've got quite a lot of boats here and it seems like there's um Quite a, quite a gradient here the, from, the, from the Baroque bow to the modern bow. Um, what, what were the changes that happened along the way and, and why, why did it develop the way it did? Why indeed. So just for fun, let's have a moment where we look at all of these five bows all at once. This is going to be kind of like juggling, <laughs> but I think, I think there may be a point to it. Mm -hmm. And finally, <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> so this is everything leading up to a modern bow. And as you can see, the tips change quite a bit as we go. We've got two kind of pointy tips right here, um, slightly shorter bows, and then we end up with this beautiful longer one with a nice amount of space in here. We get a sort of a powerful hammerhead tip here, and then finally we reach the modern bow, which is very, you know, very chunky and very powerful. <laughs> and so let's take a look. The very first of these bows is called the short bow, very elegant name, um, but it describes it pretty well. It's a short little bow. Uh, it's terrific for 17th century music. It actually has, um, it ha we haven't even figured out how to tighten the bow here yet, so this frog clips in and out. Um, you can think of this bow as you can think of all of these bows, as you know, the real descendant of a bow and arrow, where you would need you would need this to be very, very taut so that you could pull it back and immediately release an arrow wherever you wanted it to go. In my case, the arrow is the sound that I'm putting into the string. Um, but yeah, the technology will keep changing as we go. So you were in the 20, we're in the 17th century. Um, here's a tiny bit of a sonata by Dario Castello. technologically advanced bow is really good at doing certain things. It's really good at, um, at zooming all around the instrument and, um, and it's good at kind of intoning things that are both heavy and things that are very light. And 17th century violin music is all about kind of the crazy bombast of this powerful new instrument that appeared on the scene and won over hearts and minds. So this bow I think is really trying to exploit that. It's saying, check out a violin. It can play fast, it can play loud, and it sounds real good. Putting that one down and picking up um, the one that we already took a look at, this is the longbow. And it's just sort of a, a, further, um, a further construction. So this bow, for instance, might sound really nice on a Corelli Sonata. than the previous bow. Um, more length, just kind of more ability to do a few different things. Not quite as good perhaps as zooming around and just being like utterly deft and delicate, 
But, um, but overall, just like a really great all-purpose tool when what you want to do is do the Baroque thing. Next one up is um, an early classical bow. This is actually a Spanish model. And uh, just this is the moment when we move away from that sort of really sharp tip where the, where the wood of the bow leans up to the tip and makes a kind of a really short little triangle here. We've got like a lot of nice space. So what does the space do? The space allows you to kind of move away, let's say, from gestures that are only rhetorical into, um, into lovely classical phrases. But more than that, absolutely loves to be soft and delicate and to sustain in the lower part, but then to pull you up into this really lovely upper register. And once you're up there, but as you can hear, there's always sort of a lovely softness that just kind of surrounds everything. And as opposed, let's say, to kind of like the pow of a Baroque phrase, now we've got So that's cute. Next up, next up we have Let's call it a later classical bow. This would have been terrific. Mozart, maybe late Mozart, maybe even maybe even early Beethoven. This bow likes. This bow is kind of the first bow that's like looking for power. The difference in sostenuto between this bow and the last bow is really striking. second just to show you what I mean. Oh, I love this bow but just really 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 different. So if we're talking for instance something like a Beethoven quartet you have the crispness in this bow that really allows those gestures to speak. Um, and you also have, you can really go for the fortes. You know, this bow, if you say to it, hey bow, like, I would like for you to play a forte, it says, no problem. And it does it with a lot of control. One of the things that we're looking for in all of these bows is the question of how what they like to do interfaces with the music that was written at the time. And, uh, it's, it's so chicken and eggy that it's just incredibly hard to know really in any specific moments um, quite who was influencing who um, until you start looking at very, very specific details. One thing that we do know though is if we pull all the way ahead to the modern bow, um, the roots of which come from Francois Torch, he worked very specifically with the violin virtuoso um, Giovanna Battista Viotti who, and so the two of them were specifically in cahoots to design a virtuosic bow that would absolutely suit Fiasi's needs. And what is quite, quite cool about the modern bow that you don't feel on any bow previous is that it's perfectly kind of balanced. It does that sustenuto thing from frog to tip. <laughs> bows have kind of whispered in my ear, hey, I really like doing this, or I really like doing that. And, um, and this bow says, I like doing it all. You know, 
I want to I want to be able to I want to be able to sort of demonstrate strength. I want to be able to play beautiful legato lines. I also want to be able to do fun tricks. You know, just try me out, says the spell, and we'll see what happens. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to call it the eagerness of the modern day to be kind of all things. It's since this bow is over a hundred years old, that might be <laughs> <laughs> that might be pushing it to think of it in that way. Um, but it's a beautiful tool for kind of the attempt of what we're doing right now, which is to have something that we can use to play a lot of different kinds of music. However, how much more cool, rather than having one bow that does its best, how much more cool to have the individual bows that are specifically designed and that really come out of the collective experience of all the musicians in that space and the composers in that space. I mean, yeah, to me it's just, it's, it's a no-brainer that if you've got the possibility of accessing this equipment, then uh, you have so many musical opportunities that just kind of open up at your fingertips. Well, thank you so much for sharing your extensive collection and uh, how each uh, bow really is equipped with its own, uh, their own techniques that, that are really specially suited for the music of its time and how uh, they, all, they all have very different, uh, different ways of saying the same thing. I've certainly learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.